we are going to work through this review guide just for uh, <coughs> for today. I'm going to go through each one of these kind of in real time, kind of show you how I would solve each question. Um, if you're going to do this with me, uh, first of all, I recommend that you do this ahead of time, not 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 at the same time. I would recommend that you grab a calculator, your your practice guide, or some paper. Um, I would pause the video and I would go in and try each question before I just give the answers, right? That's gonna be the most beneficial situation. Um, but if you can't get anywhere, obviously I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Okay, number one, it's talking about 65% of all uh, divorce cases in, in incompatibility is in line of reason. If four couples in file for the divorce, what is the problem that exactly two will state incompatibility? Well, first of all, it is a binomial situation it is a pdf situation because we're talking about exactly two there are a total of four uh, trials i guess you could call it we want to know the probability of success is going to be 0.65 and we want to know when exactly two of them file for divorce or cite that reason as the divorce when you run this to your calculator you're going to get point Three one zero five, and that'll round to answer choice D. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the next question, a little trickier. Um, this is one of those ones where um, I've given you a question and I've really not explained this in class, but you know exactly how to do this, even though you may not connect the two things together. You are going to basically make a PDF for each of the values in, uh, in a histogram or in, in a situation um, and kind of just check to see what the changing the P does, right? So here's what I would do. L1, I'm going to make up numbers. Um, this is binomial, so we have to start with 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then L2, uh, what you can do is you can go up to the top of L2 and you can tell it to be the binomial uh, yes, yeah, so this is binomial for the first two and geometric will be for the last one. Uh, binomial, I want to do a B -I -N -O -M, binomial PDF. And I want to do, um, we'll do five trials. And we'll do point 0.5 and we're going to do L1 as all of the X values. Once you look, I'm not going to write down the numbers here, but once you n look at the list here, you can kind of get a general idea of exactly what the shape would be. In this case, it looks to be um, very symmetrical, um, slightly, because I have an odd number. Um, obviously, it can't be exactly uh, the same. Uh, here we go. You have 0 0.03, 0 0.15, 0 0.31, 0 0.31, and 0.15. And essentially, this is mostly symmetrical. It's got a little bit of skewness to one side. The question would be, what happens when we change the value for P? So I'm going to go in, and, and I'm going to do the same thing again. And in L2, this time I'm going to go back in and write down the binomial PDF, except this time we're going to do 5, and we're going to use 0.9 and L1, and we're just gonna see if it really does skew to the right. And if you look at the distribution in L2 under the binomial PDF when we have 0.9, um, skew to the right is definitely not the right term. We definitely see a very small value for zero, for one, you're talking like 3.1 times 10 to the negative seventh, and seven times 10 to the negative uh, uh, fifth. And then it becomes up, and you can obviously see that the highest actual probability ends up being on on the fourth trial here so really we have the largest value at four and then it kind of gets smaller so it's almost like you have this kind of thing so that's definitely skewed to the smaller side uh, or to the lower value so that would be skewed to the left so so this is wrong this is pretty good um, the histor histogram of a distribution of a geometric distribution is always decreasing um, in general this is uh, absolutely true because histograms have a single peak somewhere and then it can go forever. So typically, no matter where that peak falls, it's always going to have an infinitely long right side and a finite on the left side. So for geometric, 
you're definitely going to have a skew is always going to be decreasing meaning the values are headed down in into this side so i guess you could say this is skewed to the right is another way of saying that and that is true so one and three are true here although this first one a little little sketchy on the point five is always symmetrical uh, perfectly symmetrical not really but you know it's most i mean you can see the symmetry in, in the numbers when you do the histogram anyway let's move on number three we have the binomial and geometric probability situations share many conditions identify the choice that is not shared and we can know this from the beginning we know the binomial has an additional a uh, specific number of trials that has to be there before we can consider it binomial. And the probability of success, that's true. There are only two outcomes, that's true. The focus of the problem is the number of successes in the given number of trials. This is actually uh, true for binomial. That's the one of the other things that's different. The probability of success equals one minus probability of failure, that's true. The mean depends on the probability of success, that is true for both of them. So here, kind of throwing one in on you, uh, the binomial uh, X describes finding successes. The geometric X describes uh, finding one success on a specific number of trials, right? So in geometric, X represents the thing that you're counting is the number of trials, not successes. In question four, this is an inspection procedure at a manufacturing plant involves picking 30 items at random, then accepting the whole lot if at least 25 of the 30 items are in perfect condition. If in reality, 85% of the lot are perfect, what is the part of the lot will be accepted? Okay, and so this would be, we're looking to see if if the true, if the true value is 0.85, then what's the probability you could have it higher, let's see, 25 of the 30, that's the, the fraction we're looking at. So 25 out of 30, that's equal to. So basically, we're, this is 0.83. The question is really, um, we want to treat this like a, a binomial CDF problem. And so we're going to be saying that we're going to do 1 minus the binomial CDF of, we have 30 trials total. The probability of success they told us is 85%, and we're going to do 24 because what we want to do is we want to keep um, 25 and up. This basically says that if 25 of the 30 items are in perfect condition, then the whole lot would be accepted. So at least 25, That's the, I want to add up 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and find out the probability that those things happen. So we're going to do the CDF of 1 through 24, or 0 through 24, subtract that number of away, and it turns out it's going to give us 0.711, which would be E. It's kind of telling you right here which way to go with it. It is a binomial scenario because you have uh, successes or failures. It's either uh, it's in con perfect condition or it is not. Um, you have a probability of success, which is 0.85. You have a specific number of trials, which is 25, and each trial is independent. Uh, that's a common, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you're working to look at one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean the other thing's going to be bad. So independence does seem to be true here. It's reasonable to assume that. And so that's how you can get point one or 0.711. The next question is uh, asking if the WA upper school student body determined that 58% of the students were chic, then Mr. Floyd has developed a test for chicness. What is the average number of students? Keyword, their average. We would need to test. I'm looking for a trial size, so this means geometric, uh, in order to find one who is chic. So we're looking to find um, average for geometric distributions. That's super easy, it's one over P. So we would do one divided by 0.58 to find this number. And that turns out to be 1.72. We knew that was gonna be somewhere around one or two, um, just because it's 0.5. And so it looks like the answer was A. That's the first page. Page number two. If a student is randomly generating one digit numbers on his TI 83 or 84, what is the probability that the first digit number four will be the first one 
of the first eight digits, right? So we're looking for the one of the first values, right? Uh, we are looking for a geometric CDF because it's one of the first eight tries. We're looking to hit that button and see how long it takes us to generate the number four. This question can be very confusing because it's talking about lots of digits and it's using the first four will be one of the first eights and then it gets all crazy. But I'm generating numbers and I want to know how long does it take me before I see my very first digit, the number four. I'd like to know what's the probability that it would occur in one of the first eight digits, right? That's going to be a geometric. Uh, this is going to be one of the first eight. So this is going to be a CDF. We know that we're going to be, uh, it's going to be the probability of success. Well, we know that each digit has a 10% chance of being generated in a random number table or a random number generator. And we want to know what's the probability it lasts on or it lands on one of the first eight trials, right? So this is going to be the probability of success, and this is which trial are we going to be adding up to in this case because it's a CDF. And that turns out to give us 0. 0.5695, which is answer A. In number seven, the color distribution in a bag of Reese's pieces. That's not Reese's because it's supposed to rhyme with pieces. Reese's pieces, right? Found to be 13 brown, 22 orange, and 15 yellow. If a piece is randomly drawn and replaced, very important. What is the probability it will take less than eight draws? Less than eight. That would mean X is less than eight, not, not equal to eight. It takes less than eight draws to get an orange piece, right? To get my first orange piece. Here again, I'm looking at a geometric situation. We were, were looking to get orange, right? So we have 22 out of 50. And that's going to be 44% of the time, I, or 44% of the bag has orange M&Ms. So we're looking, it takes less than eight, right? So it's really one through seven. So we're going to do Geometric CDF again. That's going to go 0.44. I want to go all the way up to seven. So it's really seven and less tries to do that. That turns out to give us 0.9827 to go to four places. And that directs us to answer choice D. Okay. Number eight, which of the following? Statements is not correct. Which one of these is false? The number of successes that corresponds to the maximum value in a binomial PDF is within one unit of its mean. So maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Let's keep reading, see if we can eliminate some or find an obvious answer. A geometric PDF is always decreasing. That's a definite that's a definite thing. Okay, always, here's a question, one of the reasons I don't like this question too much, is the geometric PDF always decreasing? So we want to be absolute about that. It is an always decreasing function. In other words, if you continue to go up, 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 it definitely goes down, but there could be a slight increase at the beginning. So that one's maybe, but I think the general idea of that question is true. A binomial PDF with P is less than 0.5 will be skewed to the right. That's true. Um, if you do a binomial PDF or and you look at the sketch, wherever your P is, so if it's 0.2, it's skewed to the right. If it's 0.9, it's skewed to the left. You can check this out by making your PDFs and look at them. At them, it just always skews to the other side. That's true. As the number of trials in a geometric situation increases, and as the number of successes in a binomial situation increases, the value of the CDF approaches zero. That is absolutely false. It always adds up to one, so we know that one's the correct answer. Uh, and a PDF can be shown received by a unit. That's absolutely true. So it turns out A is actually true as well. Um, we know that that one at the bottom down there. The D is absolutely false. We know that as you go along, CDF adds up and it continually adds until it gets to the very last number. And at the maximum, it hits one. Okay, next question, number nine. The renowned soccer player Levi Grupta scores a goal on 30% of his attempts. A random variable X is defined in the number of goals uh, scored on 50 attempts, right? So, so the X is, is gonna be binomial. 
And the renowned gambler Muhammad Smith is it wins a blackjack 25% of the time. Y is defined as the number of games needed to win his first game, right? So Y is going to be geometric. Let's find out what they're asking us to do. Uh, let's define the random variable Z as a total number of soccer scores, of goal, uh, soccer goals scored, and blackjack games played. Determine the mean and standard deviation of the random variable Z, right? So X plus Y is equal to Z. So this is going to go back into chapter 16. We're adding means. That's going to be nice. Well, the mean of a binomial distribution is N times P. So we're going to do 0.3 times 50 plus the mean of geometric. That's the Y, so it's 1 over 0.25. In order to find the standard deviation of these two things, it's asking me to find the, the standard deviation. So the first one's going to be N times P times Q. Okay, so that's the standard deviation. We can't add standard deviation. We're going to, have to square that number to get the variance plus the standard deviation of the geometric mean. That's going to be the square root of 0.25 over 0.75 squared, all squared. And then once I get all of that done, we're going to square root this whole thing to get my new standard deviation. Once we calculate the mean, we find out the mean turns out to be uh, equal to 19. The standard deviation, actually, for standard deviation, I think I have got this upside down. Let me fix this. It's Q over P squared. I always forget that. So it's going to be Q in this problem is going to be 0.75 over 0.25 squared. Let me fix that. All right, now I can calculate it. Work this out, and you get 4.74 as the standard deviation. So that turns out to be D is the integer. So remember, when you're adding two distributions back in chapter 16, uh, in order to add x and y, you can add means just like you want to. That's easy. To add the to find the new standard deviation, you remember you have to find their variances, so you have to square them, um, and then add them up, and then square root that result, and you get the final answer that way. For uh, the FRQs in this questions, um, I, I, I threw in a little bit of review here. We've had a lot of FRQ practice with just the problems of the book, so this does kind of a different twist on it, um, but it's, it's, this isn't too crazy. Uh, Sophie, Miss Coley's favorite dog, loves to play catch, unfortunately. Um, Sophie, not Miss Coley, is not particularly adept at catching her uh, as her probability is only 0.15. Miss Coley is interested in determining how many tosses it will take for Sophie to catch the ball once. Can this situation be described as monomial, geometric, or nidra? Well, this is obviously going to be geometric. We have, we're trying to catch the ball only once, right? We're looking to find it how many tosses, how many trials, that's geometric. By making an appropriate assignment of digits, render a number table to form five simulations of this event. Record your simulations. Well, um, we know that it takes her 0.15 times, uh, this is her probability of success. So we're going to assign 0, 0 to 0, or sorry, to 1, 5 as catching. And we're going to do... Um, 16 through 99 as missing. Now really, uh, this isn't a very long simulation because what we're really looking to do is just to simply take how many tries does it take before she actually catches the ball, right? So trial stop when you catch, right? And Sophie catches the ball. We don't really have any worry about repeated values because uh, once, I re once I hit that, repeats are okay here um, for in terms of missing it because it's just about missing or catching. It's not a specific response. And so I'm just going to kind of underline the values, right, or, or strike through them if, if they're a miss, right? So 48 is a miss, then 74, then 77, then we have 65, 95, 32, 58, 83, 83, 92, 84, 42, 28, and then 0. 
Okay, so that was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 tries, right? So x is 14 on my first one, and that would be the first thing I would, or that's my, the end of my first trial. You're going to keep this process going um, until you do this five times. I'm going to save you the, the tediousness of watching me do that. But T1 was equal to 14. T2, you'll see real quickly, that's going to end up being four trials. T3 ends up being six trials. T4 is 26 trials. T5 is 12 trials. You can continue the trials, marking them on the, on the sheet, as you can see here. And you can see that. And at the end, I really want to do kind of label my situation. Um, part three is asking, using my simulation, what was the expected number of tosses? Well, I did it five times, and I want to average out those results. When you add up all the five trial, the, the numbers in each of the trials, we're going to get the average is equal to 12.4 tosses and uh, it's how long we would expect. Now that one's probably a little high. We did have a, a simulation to go all the way up to 26 when that was really kind of a bit beyond what we expected to see. Theoretically, we can do one divided by 0.15 and see what would what should we have gotten, right? That turns out to be 6.67. This looks a lot more like what I expected to see. Um, but here again, that's even a little bit smaller. I did have a 14, I had a 26, I had a 12. So here again, simulations, you don't have any control over how that works out. And so it just happens how it happens. In part four, theoretical distribution, you chose in part one, what is the probability that it would take us 10 tosses in order to serve you to catch the ball? So we'd like to know a geometric, PDF, we're looking to 0.15 is the probability that Sophie catches the ball, that it will take exactly 10 tosses for her to catch the ball once, right? So PDF of 10. This turns out to be 0.0347. There's about a 3.5% chance that she'd catch it on the 10th try. Okay, part B. Ms. Wilder, or Mr. Wilder, an avid baseball player and coach, decides to train Sophie. After three-day training sessions for four weeks, the probability that Sophie catches the ball has increased to 0.35. Mr. Wilder increased or interested in the number of times Sophie catches the ball in 25 tosses. Instantly, we've changed this to a binomial. We know that because he's going to toss it 25 times. Exactly. I'd like to know how many times it should catch it. Well, that's talking about the number of successes. So that changes the uh, situation to, to binomial. And in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to run uh, similar trials before, but this time we're going to be using a binomial. And so we're going to write it down. We're going to kind of use the same mentality as before. We're going to let 0, 0 to 34 be catching. And we're going to let 35 through... 99 be missing right repeats are okay we are going to stop after 25 trials and so I'm not gonna bore you with the scenario uh, but I'll tell you the results okay so we're gonna do four trials this time and Basically, I'm going to go through each one. I'll just kind of work you, kind of start you off. Um, I'm just going to mark through the misses and underline the, the catches, right? It's the question is if I go 25 times, this is going to be exactly 25 every time. How many would we catch as, or how we have catches, right? So 48 is a miss, 74 is a miss, 77 is a miss, 65 is a miss, miss. There's one catch. Right, and so then 58 would be a miss, then 83 is a miss. You get the idea, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. So trial one, we had 
eight catches. Trial two, we had eight catches. Trial three, we ended up having eight catches. And trial four, we ended up having nine catches. So the question would be, what is the average number of times Sophie would catch the ball based on my uh, simulation? It's the average of those four trials, which is going to be nine point, or sorry, eight point two five. You can average all those together, and you end up getting this. Theoretically, if we do n times p, right? So the square root, not square root, the expected value of the mean for binomial is n times p, which would be twenty-five times 0.35, which equals. 8.75. Turns out this was much closer in theory to our actual practice and just a little off. Okay. Using the theoretical distribution part one, what's the probability that Sophie will catch the ball eight times out of 25 tosses? This is your geomet or your binomial PDF. So binomial PDF. This is going to be 25. 0.35 and of course 8. That turns out to give you 0 0.1607. So there is a 16.7% chance, 16.07, 16.1% chance of catching a ball 8 times out of 25 tosses. All right, last part. It says that. Uh, Mr. Myers, knowing that Sophie is just a dog, determines that the probability that Sophie will catch the ball like is actually just 0.5. After all, she either catches it or she doesn't. Mr. Myers would like you to find out the number of tosses required for Sophie to catch the ball three times. Okay? And so the question for the part C is on the next page. Here, is this binomial geometric or neither? Well, in this case, it's going to be neither because we're catching the uh, third success, right? For her to catch it three different times. Um, it's the number of tosses. So I'm looking for a trial number, but I'm not looking for the first success, which is what geometry is, geometric distribution is. So because it's the first, uh, because it's the third success, right? Not the first is a problem for this. If it had been the first, then uh, that would be a different question and that would make it geometric but in this case you're looking for something that we really don't look at a whole lot and so that would be it okay and you can just simply forget about this piece don't worry about it okay and that's your review guide so um, there's a lot into this um, I would take a minute I would definitely spend some time looking at the multiple choice but I would also go back and do your book problems I made a video on, on those questions, uh, of the ones that I thought were uh, pretty important, uh, the, at least the different style of questions, and you can always try the opposite, the other ones in the book. Usually just after the ones that I select, there are some multiple copies. Um, I would expect to see questions just like that on the test. So take this review guide that we just went through, take the book problems, and kind of run through those and make sure that you can do them comfortably and you know confidently know what how to do each of the questions. If you get a question, please feel free to email me and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Have a great day.